الشيطان الرجيم ومن الناس من يشتري له الحديث ليضل عن سبيل الله بغير علم ويتخذها هجوا أولئك لهم عذاب مهين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أفمن هذا الحديث تعجبون وتضحكون ولا تبكون وأنتم سامدون فاسجدوا لله واعبدوا Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Waleed Lang and I have been elected by acclamation, I might say, to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. His name is Muhammad Abdul Hakim Thomas. He was born in Belgium, but he was reared in New York, where he purchased the Quran at the age of 11 and accepted Islam seven years later in 1985. He has an MA in Applied Linguistics and a BA in music. He has participated in translations of Islamic publications from English to Mali and has conducted several Islamic lectures both in the Kingdom and in the U.S. He is currently working as a lecturer at King Saud University in the English department in the Institute of Languages and Translation. Today's topic is thoughts on music and Islam. Thank you. And there are among men those who purchase idle talk in order to mislead others from Allah's path without knowledge and who throw ridicule upon it. For such there will be a humiliating punishment. Do you marvel at this statement at last at those and laugh and do not weep while you amuse yourselves proudly in vanities. Rather prostrate before Allah and worship Him. Uh, the topic tonight is uh, some thoughts on music in Islam. Um, as my introducer mentioned, I have a lot of experience in that area and I've spent most of my life studying music very seriously. I want to begin by saying that music is of course everywhere. It's something that's uh, part of being human. You find music in every society all over the world. Just like you find marriage or you find language or you find uh, folklore or dancing. This is something that you find in all cultures. From Mecca to Mississippi you'll find this. Music surrounds us everywhere, wherever we go. If we're on a bus, if we're on a train, walking around, uh, television, of course, film. Uh, we find music is just, um, is just everywhere. Now, Islam, of course, as we know, is a comprehensive religion dealing with all aspects of life, and music is no exception. Islam uh, does talk about music and teaches us about music, just as it teaches us about marriage and folklore and the other things that I mentioned earlier, things that are part of being human. Islam is not silent about music, although some people say so. We find that uh, there is some controversy actually among Muslims uh, concerning music. And I can say from the outset that I'm not here to uh, settle every controversy simply because I'm not qualified to do so. However, I hope inshallah that I am qualified uh, to give you nasiha as a Muslim and as someone who has a little bit of experience in these matters. So inshallah, tonight I hope we can look, uh, take a look at music in light of our religion, in light of Islam, and in light of some experience, uh, both personal experience and experience of those in our society. As I mentioned before, I spent most of my life studying music. I started when I was about maybe this big 
with the Suzuki method of uh, violin, which is um, a method by which you give uh, the person the instrument and just tell them to go and play. And then later on, we'll develop them to great musicians, supposedly. Uh, later on, I studied uh, a piano and guitar and baritone and several instruments, and also music theory. And later on, I went to the university. I attended the uh, Indiana University School of Music, which is the largest music school uh, in the United States, uh, where I studied classical and, and jazz piano. Before that, though, I had a lot of experience uh, playing music professionally and also teaching music. I taught piano for, uh, for a long time to adults and to children, and uh, also taught music theory. And I've had some very interesting experiences working as a musician. Now, we find in the West, as well as in the East, that many times the people who are involved in music tend to have a certain character. We find, for example, that people who are very, very serious about music sometimes tend to get a little bit arrogant about it. Uh, we find, for example, uh, classical musicians will practice eight hours a day, and they're very, very serious about it. So serious that they feel that people who don't do that are not real musicians, and they should not waste their time being around such people. We find also, a lot of the time, among musicians, we find things like drug abuse and other corruption. Uh, we find this also among people who are involved in, in other arts. Um, a lot of the time, artists feel that uh, they are a segment of society that do not need to follow the same rules as the rest of the society, that they are somehow special, and that they are on the cutting edge of uh, the way the world should be. And they will reject the norms of the society, um, such as religion, for example, and such as other conventions. Um, I found in my experience that um, that drugs particularly was a very, very, very uh, large part of the music, um, music scene. Not only with rock music and, and jazz music, but even with classical music. People become involved in drug abuse. We know, of course, that music is so powerful and it affects emotions to such an extent that it can be, in fact, a substitution for spirituality. People become so involved in music, it becomes like, uh, like a religion almost. And uh, they have a spiritual experience uh, brought about uh, by both listening to music or, and or playing the music. One of my experiences I had when I was a teenager, I was playing in a rock band. And we were hired to play at uh, one particular club. Uh, for uh, a child's confirmation. A confirmation is something that's done in the Catholic Church in which uh, a young man, a young woman, young man in this case, is uh, confirmed as a Catholic. From this point on, he is considered a, an adult uh, Catholic. And so we went to, to play uh, the music at this, at this confirmation, and the father of the child came to us, and he came to me in particular and said, Listen, if you guys want to do anything, just go ahead and do it. If you want to do anything beforehand, Go ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead. So we said, well, we thought it sounded kind of strange, but we said, yeah, okay, okay. And then later he came back again, because he thought that maybe we didn't understand him. And he said, remember, I'm saying you can do anything you want beforehand, so that you'll, you'll play the music very well. And he said, uh, okay, okay. Finally he said, look, if you want to go and smoke some marijuana or take some other drugs, just go ahead and do it. <laughs> Because his feeling was that if we were high and if we were under the influence of these drugs, that we would play very, very well. <laughs> so we happened to have some drugs with us at the time. And we, um, he invited us um, to his van. He had a van there. And he said, just stay in here for a little while and do whatever you want. <laughs> so naturally, we, uh, we did what he asked. And we came back with our minds not really with us. And when we got back, we started playing the music, and at least we thought it was good. And we found that we had a tremendous effect on, on the people that were there, that they were ready to do anything that we told them to do. Uh, the lead singer, for example, uh, told all these people, um, there was a large display uh, at the area. He says, you know, just take part of it and break it. Take one balloon and pop it. And the whole place was destroyed in a matter of a second. It was incredible. Um, so not only were we not quite with our senses, but the rest of the people there were not with their senses at all. Now, of course, there are two things operating here, both the drugs and the music, but they came together. And we find that oftentimes um, they come together. Um, 
But later on, of course, we found out that the, the club was were very angry at us for causing all this damage, and, and the boy's mother was very angry at us, even though the father was the one who wanted us to get so high in the first place. That's just one of many, many experiences. Oftentimes we found that, that when we were using drugs and playing the music, we thought we were just playing the best music that ever, that ever happened, ever, in the whole world. We'd be playing and say, wow, this is great. And then the next day, when we were no longer under, under the influence of the drug, we would listen to the tapes and say, wow, that's terrible. How did that ever happen? Um, but of course, that was the effect of the drug. Now, I'd like to take a look now at some of the major music personalities um, in the world, uh, particularly in the West. Um, of course, if I talk about rock and roll, everybody knows that these people are often involved in such activities. You find um, some music singers, for example, uh, use so much drugs that they die of it. Um, I can think of another one in particular who um, would have so much sex when he was out uh, doing his concerts that he actually took out paternity insurance so that in case a woman were to sue him and say, hey, I'm carrying your child, he'd say, hey, no problem. I have insurance. So there's nothing to worry about. This is true. Uh, for example, we find in America the personality of Elvis. Um, Elvis is a singer who became so popular that he was almost worshipped. And I've heard uh, one woman in particular talk about believing in Elvis uh, after, the, after he had died. Uh, some people, of course, claim that he never died. Uh, people collect relics of Elvis, just like they might try to collect a relic of, of Jesus Christ. This is a piece of the cross on which Jesus was crucified. They'll say, this is a piece of tile from the floor of Elvis's bathroom. This is true. This is a piece of Elvis's head. And they will have auctions in which they sell these things for hundreds and hundreds of dollars, even thousands of dollars. A photograph I once saw of Elvis with his signature on got $500, easily, from someone who wanted a piece of that. Um, we find the much celebrated Beatles, for example, were uh, drug addicts. Uh, John Lennon uh, was a heroin addict. And although he's often remembered for uh, talking about giving peace a chance, um, he was really into giving a, a peace a chance, P-I-E-C, and a, a piece of... Uh, a piece of some sort of drug. Um, and there are many, many others who, who, who found a similar fate. In the field of jazz, jazz music. Jazz music is, uh, is an Afro-American art um, uh, that came about in the, in the 20th century. We find that just about all of the major figures were deeply involved in drugs and other corruptions. Um, Jelly Roll Morton, he was the first great composer of jazz music. And he was a pimp. A pimp is somebody who sells a woman as a prostitute. This is his profession. He did music on the side. He was a hustler. He cheated people out of their money. And he was extraordinarily arrogant about his music. He claimed to have in invented jazz on such and such a date and thought that nobody else was any good. And he is the, the father of jazz competition. Um, Duke Ellington and Dizzy Gillespie, they were involved in, um, in the big band era, in which they would play music and people would dance, men and women dancing together, uh, just going crazy. Um, Charlie Parker is another one who is uh, celebrated as probably one of the greatest musical geniuses of jazz ever. And he died a heroin addict. Although he was considered a genius, he spent a lot of his time lying down in the gutter in the street and died like that. Um, Coleman Hawkins was an alcoholic, another great uh, jazz musician. Um, John Coltrane also died a heroin addict. And of course, Miles Davis, who died recently, he survived his drug addiction days, but, um, um, but died, died recently after many years. Now, maybe you haven't heard these names before, uh, but maybe some of you have, and you realize that these are the giant figures in jazz music, and they all ended up with that sort of end. In classical music, a lot of the time in the West we think of the classical composers as being such um, lofty uh, figures, very disciplined, very intelligent, geniuses. Um, but we find that uh, Mozart, for example, was an alcoholic, had all his girlfriends. He was sort of a party animal. He was also a mason, 
he belonged to uh, the Masonic cult, and um, and was was deeply deeply involved in that. And even wrote one opera um, involving uh, the Muslim world and Turkey in particular. We find that Beethoven, who again is celebrated as probably one of the greatest composers ever, uh, was really a, a sort of a crazy man. He used to um, urinate out of his window um, anytime he felt like it. His house was a complete mess. Um, he would yell and he was very grouchy all the time and um, people couldn't get along with him. Interestingly, he became deaf towards the end of his life, couldn't hear anything, and at that time uh, composed uh, what's considered a very great piece of music. Um, uh, Mendelssohn, for example, uh, was a Jewish composer, um, and he was hated by another composer of his time named Wagner. Who was, uh, Wagner was sort of a pre-Nazi. He hated Jews, and therefore he hated Mendelssohn. And um, he was so arrogant, he felt that he was just God's gift to the world because he knew how to write opera. His operas would go on for hours and hours and hours. Schumann, also another great composer, he lost his mind completely and ended up in an insane, insane asylum. And of course there was Schoenberg, who was a 20th century composer. Uh, he was so arrogant that um, he told the world that he had just created a new system of musical notation and composition uh, to ensure German superiority in music uh, for the next century. Ironically, he was thrown out of Germany because he was a Jew and he was thrown out uh, by the Nazis. So we find that all these great people in music actually had um, uh, very strange uh, lifestyles often involving self-destructive behavior. behavior. Um, I want to emphasize also that uh, in the East, um, perhaps you have uh, music may, may be looked upon as something that you know maybe a silly person does, uh, but in the West it is taken with the with the extreme uh, seriousness. I remember when I was in music music school, we found people they practiced all the time, all the time, just constantly practicing, trying to make their art perfect, and the music just simply becomes an end unto itself. So if you look at the professions. Uh, of music, we find that it's usually associated uh, with things like, as I mentioned, alcohol and drugs. It's often associated with mixed dancing, meaning dancing between uh, men and women. It's often associated with uh, religion. Um, and of course, there's not uh, music in, in the Islamic tradition, as far as worship goes, if we ignore some Sufi things. Um, and therefore, it's usually Christian. Um, and also uh, parlor music which people like to sit around and have a little drink and, and pretend that they're very sophisticated while they listen to, to a musician. So we find that, that this sort of profession in itself is very, very, very questionable for someone who's a Muslim. A Muslim is someone who's supposed to stay away from drugs, stay away from alcohol, stay away from self-destructive behavior in general. So we find that before we've even looked at any hadith or anything uh, from the sunnah, we find that the lifestyle of the musician is very, very, very questionable indeed. <clears throat> Oftentimes in song, when people um, sing, um, we find that some of the biggest topics uh, for song are often other sonic things as well. When people sing, they often sing about uh, romantic love. Um, or premarital sex, or dancing, or rebellion against society, um, youth culture, and even suicide, and, and even uh, worship of, of, of other gods and this sort of thing. An extreme example in the West might be um, this heavy metal music, which often includes uh, satanic songs and groups. Um, one in particular is called Merciful Fate. This is the name of a band from, from uh, Scandinavia. And they were uh, Satanists. They just came out and said, yes, we worship Satan. Satan is the one that we love. And one song uh, is quoted, my, it ends with a statement, my sweet Satan, named Shaitan. My sweet Satan, you are the one. And they openly worship Satan. In my area, in, in New York, there was one young man about 13 um, who was murdered in a satanic ritual involving this uh, kind of music. His eyes were gouged out of his head before he was murdered. There have also been several suicides associated with this kind of music. 
Um, two suicides in particular also happened in the Midwest, in the United States. Two young men were listening to a Judas Priest album. That's the name of one of these groups. And they just became so high with the music that they just decided that they should kill themselves. And they took their shotguns. People in the country often have shotguns. And they went out of the house, and the first one took it, shot himself in the head, and killed himself on the spot. Now the second young man, he felt maybe he shouldn't do it. But now he felt committed because his son, and his, uh, his friend had just killed himself. So he thought that he'd better do it too. And he started reciting uh, what he had heard, or what he thought he heard in the music. Uh, do it, do it, do it. And he shot himself. We know the story because he survived for a short time. And his family came and he told them that they had listened to the music and, and they felt um, inspired to kill themselves for that. In the same area, there was another young man listening to heavy metal music who decided to kill himself. He shot himself in the head with a shotgun that was unsuccessful with his suicide. And now he's um, very uh, disformed, deformed and, and disfigured. Um, the first case that I mentioned was, was so shocking to people that they decided to try to legislate uh, heavy metal music and music in general to try to get people to say, well, look, um, maybe we shouldn't listen to this music. Something's wrong here. And they petitioned the government. They went to the Capitol and they said, look, we've got to regulate music. We've got to put warning labels on these records, on these CDs, to warn people about the music. This music might cause something bad to happen. Um, of course, in the United States, we have you know, these different freedoms, so none of these laws have ever gone through. But there was a very strong and active movement to try to get not only some music banned, but also to, uh, to try to warn people about this music. Another example is, um, is one group, um, it was a rap group, and they used to sing about sex all the time, uh, even rape and, and abuse of women. And people tried to get them arrested also. In fact, they were arrested, and they tried to ban the music. But again, because of uh, certain freedoms, uh, mentioned the laws in the United States, everything was thrown out, and they were allowed to continue um, their music. Of course, this controversy always generates much more interest than, than should actually be there about, uh, about this music. As soon as something becomes controversial, everybody says, hey, we want to buy the record that caused somebody to shoot themselves. Or we want to buy the record uh, that caused somebody to rape somebody. And they immediately try to listen to it more and more. And so the problem grows. So, of course, we can easily agree that as Muslims, um, any music that calls someone to something that is un-Islamic must be completely and totally avoided. So any song having to do with uh, doing something with Haram, a drinking song, for example, absolutely must be completely avoided. Uh, something asking you to dance with this beautiful girl, uh, not, not permissible uh, in Islam. Now one could also easily argue that, well, if we have some music that doesn't have any words in it, maybe that would be allowed. Uh, because there's nobody singing or telling me to do anything. It's just music, and I could sit down and relax and listen to music. So at this point, um, we should turn to the Islamic literature and try to see what is actually said um, about music. Again, I want to mention that I'm not a scholar, um, but I can convey some things that are in our literature, inshallah. Um, there are some Quranic verses dealing with um, what some say is music, um, which we recited at the very beginning. Uh, some people say that this vain talk applies to music. Others disagree, um, but there is that opinion. We also find in the Hadith literature, though, authentic Hadith dealing, dealing with music. Uh, this one Hadith